The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I can officially say that because it is now 12.01. My name is Cynthia Schwartz, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the SLA Competitive Intelligence Division March 2019 webinar titled, How Non-Market Intelligence Can Help You. It will be presented by Jim Miller, and we are delighted, thrilled actually, to have all of you with us. We're delighted as well to give a shout out and a very sincere thank you to our continued sponsor for the SLA CID webinars in 2019, and that is Aurora WDC. Their Reconvergence G2 conference in April is going to focus on the evolving mission of the intelligence and information community as we deepen, as they deepen our impact on the growth of organizations that we serve, all of us. So and there are still tickets available for the conference um, and there will be a link that will be posted in the chat window so that you can get more information about that uh, and that will be posted shortly. And of course, that mission of growth ties in with the subject of our webinar today. And before we begin that, I just want to give a few announcements for you. Uh, from the CI division, we have a revamped board structure and we still have a few openings for volunteers like you. We're currently looking for a communications chair, and if you are interested in exploring that with us, please do drop a note in the chat window if you are interested, and we'll be able to follow up with you. The second announcement, and this is a reminder, of course, that the early bird registration deadline for the SLA annual conference in Cleveland is April 1st. So please do remember to register for the conference and saving money is yours. Uh, and if you do need help getting to Cleveland, the CI division is offering three travel grants in the amount of $599 each. And all you have to do is apply for those. And the link to apply will also be placed in the chat box. And the submissions for those travel grants are due on April 14th. Uh, again, the CI division is also taking nominations for the Distinguished Leader Award. And if you know someone who deserves recognition for their contributions, you'll find the link to that form in the chat box as well. And it's the form, the title of that award is Distinguished Leader Award. And one last item is the, the CI division is teaming with the CI Fellows to gauge interest in a mentorship program. If you would be interested in either finding a mentor or being one, you'll find a link to a short interest survey in the chat box. We're taking that interest survey before we create the program, so we'd definitely like to hear from you on those. And those are our announcements, and now I would like to offer a very quick bio of our distinguished presenter, Jim Miller. Jim is the principal of Connect Public Affairs, a consultancy that provides strategic competitive intelligence to organizations to help them effectively deal with government and the non-market environment. For more than 20 years, he served as a strategic advisor to numerous cabinet ministers at the federal and provincial levels of government in Canada. Jim is the chair of the Public Policy Advisory Council of Special Libraries Association. He is also a member of the professional, excuse me, of the Professional Development Advisory Council and also content chair of the Competitive Intelligence Division. So if you would all please welcome Jim Miller. And Jim, I'm going to turn over the microphone to you now. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Uh, Thank you for that introduction. And again, I'd like to also thank Aurora WDC for their ongoing continued sponsorship of our webinar series. We're quite fortunate to ha have them uh, sponsor our uh, webinars and we've done uh, quite well by them. And the, their continued support allows us to bring this uh, inform great information to you. So today I want to talk to you about uh, non-market intelligence and uh, non-market intelligence is something that we don't hear a lot about. We're mostly you know, interested in sort of market activities uh, in the intelligence community. So I'll just give you a sense of what we'll be uh, looking at today. I can get my slides to advance here. 
So we're going to look at, <coughs> excuse me, what uh, non-market intelligence is. Um, so brief uh, introduction to what it is. We're also going to look at why it's important, and I think it's becoming more and more important um, to the intelligence community to keep the non-market environment in, in focus um, as uh, the world becomes more global and uh, certainly governments begin to, to have greater influence on um, organizations. Then we're going to look at some tools and techniques. So this is just a, a spat, smattering, sorry, of uh, potential, <clears throat> excuse me, tools that you can use um, to do competitive analysis of, of the non-market environment and also to help monitor the non-market environment. And then we're going to look at some resources of where to find information. There's a lot of uh, government information out there that can be used uh, in, in your competitive intelligence analysis. And um, there, it's, <clears throat> the great thing is that it's mostly all free. Um, and uh, it, the focus will be on Canada and the United States. Uh, although I'm in Canada, um, I've also got a lot of US examples because in a lot of cases, the United States um, has better provision of information uh, from the government uh, than where I'd find it. So what is non-market intelligence? So non-market intelligence consists of the social, political, legal arrangements <clears throat> that structure interactions among companies, <clears throat> excuse me, and the public. Um, so it provides an early warnings to, of stuff coming from the global public policy environment and how it's going to affect the company's strategy. So in this sense, we're looking at the actions of government, the actions of public interest groups. Uh, we're looking at the, the actions of uh, political parties and uh, government agencies that affect your business and will actually um, control, like put control on your environment. Um, so the why is it important? So certainly we've all heard recently about a number of things that uh, um, have happened within the public policy environment and the regulatory environment. Um, you know, the grounding of the 737 MAX planes would cost Boeing billions of dollars um you know that they predicted that uh, a three-month grounding will be just of uh, all the planes <clears throat> would be over a billion dollars uh just just for the possibility of it being grounded for uh three months and there's a perfect example of government action that um is affecting a business operation and <clears throat> in a lot of cases now the debate is whether or not Boeing uh, could have taken preventative steps to to um, you know prevent some of these things from occurring, whether it be from providing more information to airlines and pilots, um, even to, to the writing up of the the, the uh, flight manual for the plane itself. So um, there's certainly a number of regulatory agencies that, that are looking into this um, and. You know, looking at what the possible scenarios are for Boeing is going to be fairly important. Uh, here in Canada, we have a um, fifteen billion dollar legal settlement in Quebec. So the province of Quebec, uh, the court has ruled that uh, the tobacco companies in Canada uh, are re responsible for you know health concerns. It was fifteen dollar fifteen billion dollar legal settlement. All three of these companies now have applied for creditor protection in Canada, so the payments uh, have been delayed. Uh, when, once again, being aware of what the uh, non-market environment is with the legal, legal and the regulatory uh, rules around uh, tobacco usage. Uh, of course, tobacco is one of the most heavily regulated industries um, as far as it's regulated on how you can grow it to all the ways to where you can consume it. So regulation plays a big part in the operation of tobacco companies worldwide. And the non-market intelligence uh, functions is quite important for uh, companies like this to actually uh, function.
this is one that just came out yesterday, actually, a great example, Purdue Pharma uh, in the, in the uh, United States, uh, $270 million opioid settlement with Oklahoma. So this is the, because of their, uh, the opioid crisis and, and uh, this particular example is that, so it's $270 million, sorry, just in Oklahoma, uh, which would work out to about uh, $41,000 per death uh, just in Oklahoma. So if you were to actually extrapolate that out, uh, not necessarily that this is going to happen, but it's going to mean that, you know, tens of billions of dollars that Purdue Pharma would be responsible for. Again, uh, it's a non-market um, with as far as regulations uh, are, or how they're followed, how, you know, as far as marketing to doctors, uh, advertising to patients, uh, all of those things are non-market non -market activities that actually affect the operation of companies such as Purdue Pharma um, in, in, in their operations. <clears throat> so I talked about some of the threats that, per, that uh, people have actually uh, seen and the importance of it there. And I want to talk about some of the opportunities that uh, non-market intelligence can help with. So um, one of the great things that you could actually use competitive intelligence non-market is to find funding opportunities for uh, whether it be for a for-profit or a not-for-profit uh, organization and then look at what the potential usages are um, that would actually help to get maximum benefit for your company. So we have grants for different programming. If you have for, for training, they have taxing credits. Um, here in Canada, we just had our budget last week. Uh, and they had some significant uh, tax incentives and credits for people to take uh, training. Um, industrial assistance, so that's regional, regional development incentives. Uh, and you'll, you'll notice the tax incentives that we had there for the uh, electric vehicles <clears throat> is, significant, is something that's growing in significance. And I think that it, in setting up how the market operates, um, these have a, going to have an impact uh, whether or not they, you know, affect how the, the market operates. And then uh, grants.gov, a great source uh, in the United States that shows of all the different grants that are available um, to organizations that could apply for them. A lot of them are for not-for-profit organizations. Um, and I know here in Canada, uh, the department I work for, we gave over $4 billion worth of grants just for uh, training, training programs. So it's not an insignificant amount that is, is available, and that's just one department. Um, So one of the greatest things about the uh, non-market intelligence is the looking at reputation management and how is your organization viewed by government. So here we have Mr. Zuckerberg uh, appearing before Congress, and uh, you know that the this gets amplified by other pieces of social media. So in, in a way that the, the government themselves could can portray organizations as um, Good players, bad players. Uh, certainly, there's a significant growth in corporate social responsibility that has increased for, with various companies. Uh, and then, of course, with social media, that just amplifies what what the uh, view or the reputation of particular organizations are. And I think companies have to be more aware of you know how they're seen by government and what governments are. Um, doing in in canada we they recently facebook announced that they were going to ban political ads um for upcoming election um and then <clears throat> the government actually <laughs> was negative on facebook because of that because obviously they use uh, facebook ads themselves so just that back and forth between uh, how your company is seen um, and making sure that you position yourself is fairly important for the uh, intelligence function in the non-market environment. So another great opportunity um, 
that you could find through a non-market information intelligence <clears throat> are various procurement opportunities. So if we look at here, there's an example of just the uh, military budget for the United States government um, in their, and their spending. And it's a significant amount of money um, that, they're, that they're spending. It also helps you to look at what your competitors are bidding on. Are they spending the time to put to answer an RFP? Are they not, um, you know, looking at particular opportunities? And in, in some cases, that's with industries that like defense. Um, you, governments are your your uh, sorry your customer. So it's important that you understand where. Um, the procurement opportunities are coming, how the system operates for procurement, and what your competitors are doing uh, in, in the procurement environment. Currently here in Canada, we have a, a significant uh, procurement of uh, naval ships and also supply, sh supply ships that is going through some uh, uh, the process as well as some legal legal struggles as well because of the how the process process works or doesn't work for that matter. Uh, so it's important that in doing your intelligence analysis that you're actually looking at what are the potential procurement opportunities and what are your competitors doing. So public consultations, it's very important that you that in the intelligence we're looking at what public consultations are going on um, throughout um, government. And it's important for two reasons. One is a sort of defense, so you actually get to see what other people are saying about you and how you're viewed. Um, because the you know public public because they are public consultations, you'll have everyone and the, and their brother um, wanting to participate and you know make a statement. Uh, and then the second part of the public consultations that's important is um, that you, as an organization, can make a public statement as well. Um, so it's more of a how do you get your message out there and make sure you're getting a, a fair and balanced view of what your issues are. Um, <clears throat> certainly here, this is an example of the Keystone Excel pipeline, uh, which, which was important both here in Canada and in the United States. Um, as far as a number of communities were concerned, whether it be environmental communities, whether it be indigenous communities, uh, agriculture, farming. So the, the, the public consultations uh, touches on numerous issues and also um, numerous uh, interest groups. And it's important to monitor that and to know what your environment is when public consultations are going on so that you you, you can have your organization in the best best light and help your with your uh, company strategy. Here's a perfect example of this: Amazon HQ2. So Amazon HQ2 originally, as if you remember, they they went through a lengthy process to find the HQ2. We had governments across Canada and the United States that spent. Uh, significant amounts of money and offered significant amounts of um, incentives to Amazon to relocate, um, or sorry, not relocate, but to locate uh, their second headquarters. And so they, through, after about a year of the process, they finally selected North, well, sorry, uh, Virginia and um, New York City, and then the public outcry for New York City um, made them to cancel their HQ2. So I think in the, in the due diligence of looking at um, how is the public interest group uh, seeing your organization, how is the change? Because you also have to remember that uh, there was a change in government and a change in, in uh, representatives uh, during this time period. Uh, when the selection was made, and certainly uh, Amazon could have avoided a number of headaches had they been a bit more aware, following their um, environmental, uh, you know, scanning of what their non-market environment was. 
So some of the tools that we want to look at some of the tools that we can use actually for uh, the um, non-market intelligence. So stakeholder management is certainly uh, very important. And there are certain tools here looking at uh, stakeholder matrixes uh, with regard to who your stakeholders are. This allows you to look at who you should be focusing on, who you don't need to focus on, and who you can actually, because it can actually help you in um, both positive and negative. So the positive would be, you know, helping to find partners for collaborative opportunities, helping to work with certain uh, stakeholders that could actually promote your uh, organization. And then also there's the sort of threat component where there are potentially stakeholder groups, whether they be internal or external, uh, that could actually, you know, be negative uh, for your organization. So it's fairly important here we, to see that you're doing the stakeholder management um, beforehand so that you can take the appropriate action. Another, another great uh, tool to use scenario mapping. So looking at what are the, <clears throat> what are the actual possible scenarios that could uh, be outcomes for particular actions. So you could actually do scenario mapping around uh, government issues in the sense that uh, the government may change regulation, they may change uh, legislation, and you have to look, know what all the potential outcomes uh, could do be, and looking at what all the possibilities are uh, that you would be dealing with. Now, this is important in two ways, in the sense that there's the uh, proactive component, which is you look at the scenarios, you do the scenario mapping, and you help to um, contribute to developing a strategy to get this the outcome that you want um, through the various other techniques, whether it be a grassroots campaign, whether it be uh, lobbying. So the scenario mapping can actually help you to look at your non your non market environment and to uh, put together strategies that gets the best outcome for your organization, or it also helps you to sort of negate uh, losses and deal with um, or minimize uh, negative impacts. Another great tool is uh, the pest, pestle. Now this is sometimes also heard as, as, as steep. Um, more recently as pestles, looking at your, the political environment, what are your political factors? Economic factor, so what is what are interest rates, which of course are controlled by the government, uh, through banking, the or make a big factor, social factors. So what is the social, what is the social climate like? Environmental factors, again, very important when you look at government regulation around um, environmental assessment, also around what are what are um, environmental business like interest groups doing, uh, where are they positioning your organization, whether positive or negative. Uh, legal factors. So if we're looking at the legal factors that um, are coming forward, that the tobacco and the Purdue Pharma are perfect examples there um, as to what to actually monitor to be able to um, to be able to look at what are the possible outcomes and, and the possible scenarios for your organization. Uh, technological, um, sorry, I've got them out of, out of order, but the technological factors, again, growing new um, technology and how that can be implemented uh, into your organization uh, in order to ad advance the strategy of your organization. So this is another tool you could run through with your organization uh, to to make sure that all these it's sort of a broad range of components that are being addressed um, within the environment your sort of non-market environment so that you could actually uh, operate effectively another great tool um, which i've used quite frequently um, is a freedom of information act requests 
Uh, in Canada, it's known as Access to Information Act uh, or and privacy, so ATIP, FOIA in the United States. Great benefits for this is to look at um, getting the information. So basically, you're, you're looking for uh, government information that is not publicly available. Sorry, it is publicly available. It's just not in plain sight. Um, so what it allows you to do is determine who key players are inside and outside the government, who is um, working on a particular file that may be of, of interest to your organization. It actually helps you to look at government timelines. Um, so I'll use an example with uh, the drone industry and looking at <clears throat> what the timelines are, uh, where I was able to use this to look at the uh, timelines of the beyond visual line of sight regulations for drones uh, to, to see uh, where Canada was with regard to uh, implementing regulation, regulations for that industry. Um, you can actually see what competitors may be doing. Uh, this is a bit harder to get through uh, FOIA because they usually will say that it's a uh, you know commercial secret, so they wouldn't um, they wouldn't disclose that information. But in some cases where the government is uh, purchasing um, or helping to assist um, organizations, then they would disclose that information so you can see uh, what their competitor companies are doing. And then uncovering alternative possible policy approaches that are being considered. So when governments are def defining policies, they'll have various scenarios or options. Um, you can actually see what is the possible options that they are considering. And this could help you to help in the proactive sense of steering um, the government to a option that is you know, more optimum for your organization. And uh, that, that actually is, is very helpful in the sense that you, you see that what the alternatives are and can um, then actually steer them away from uh, options as well that may be of benefit to your uh, competitors. And I've seen that being done before, uh, which I re uncovered through uh, FOI, where a, uh, a tobacco company uh, it, it had submitted a uh, example of uh, taxation of a particular filter component on a cigarette. Uh, in order to help combat black market cigarettes. Well, the interesting component of this, or the interesting part of this is that uh, every other tobacco company in Canada used that filter, except for the company that um, put forth that solution. So, you know, they were great if their competitors had to pay extra taxes on that. Um, definitely an advantage to that for them. Um, so for your requests, it's sort of a how-to. Uh, I've actually, uh, well, gladly or, or not, <laughs> I had to do numerous of these, and uh, they can be frustrating. It's not one of the actual priorities of government to disclose information. Uh, a lot of governments talk a good game about being open and transparent. They're getting better, uh, but it is, uh, you know, frustrating. I'm actually uh, right at the moment working on one that's coming up on three years that I've been waiting for information, um, and so they can drag their feet. But in in doing a FOIA request, that's that's not saying that all of them will take that long. That's uh, but some of them can. Uh, but look at your aims and objectives. Why are you using the intelligence? So always start with the why. Why are you? What do you want to show? Uh, and then also construct the appropriate text. It's very important because the when they ask for a request, they will be quite particular because for them it's a lot of work to go through all of the potential documents that are available. So, and also on the other flip of that is that if you don't ask for it, you won't get it. So it's, a, it's a very important that you provide to the government department that you're looking for uh, everything that you're looking for. So when you say types of records, whether that be emails, voicemails, uh, even videos, 
um, can be requested. Also, narrowing the time frame down to a particular time actually helps speed things along. And any exclusions to be made. Uh, the exclusions piece is important too because there's some information that you just know they're not going to give you. Um, it's you know classified information, it's trade secrets. They're not going to give it to you, so don't ask for it. It, it actually helps to improve uh, relations with the department, and it actually helps you to get things faster. Um, again, uh, important step is always follow up. So once you've submitted the uh, FOIA request, follow up with that department just to make sure how things are going, make sure that they're still working on it. Be vigilant on timelines. Here in Canada, they have um, 30 days to provide to you in the information you request after um, you make the request. Uh, I've never actually uh, seen that happen, uh, <laughs> but it is it is the, what the regulations stipulate. Uh, the departments can ask for, for uh, extensions you just have to be sure that you can stay vigilant so they don't ask for too much of an extension and know your rights of course that's just fairly basic so one of the great things with the government information is that it's a valuable source for ci uh, again as i said there's uh, great information there that could be done on a number of fronts that could actually help you again most of this information is free certainly there are uh, uh, pay for use databases that are, will also provide this information uh, for you uh, like statenet or propublica um I, i'm you know maybe it's the canadian scottish in me the big cheap uh used to like the the uh, the uh free component but it's also because being a librarian you know where the stuff is so why not just Go and get it. So, you know, here's some of the things that we'll be covering. Um, for example, IP filings, annual reports for companies, uh, natural resources development plans, and what are their, their timelines for uh, major, uh, that's particularly in the mining and um, oil extraction industries. Uh, RFPs, major projects that are going on in government is themselves. So, if you look at government. Uh, uh, projects and we have one uh, currently here in Canada that's over a billion dollars just for a, a software payroll system. Um, access to information requests, you can actually get past copies of stuff that other people have requested for. And then just in the basic um, information, you know, the statistics that are provided by government also uh, here in Canada, Parliamentary Committee Research in, in the United States, uh, Congressional Research Services actually has uh, quite a few uh, research projects that are available to the public and you can just download the information and look at, you know, what is the information that Congress has considered um, in developing their legislation. So let's take a look. So, so here's the sources for legislation. So legislation, knowing the um, what the legislation is even up to the point of knowing variations of the legislation there could be different versions of it uh, in that, that and knowing uh, what the legislation stipulates is very important um, to organizations so that they can do due diligence so they can plan for uh, new product development um, if, if they're going to you know regulate um, and or legislate perfect example here in Canada and also growing in the United States this is the cannabis industry um, and legislation that is going to be passed with regard to uh, cannabis consumption and production uh, very very significant another great example of legislation that's going to actually change significantly change the world uh, brexit and you know certainly there's going to be a, the legislation that will be involved and it's it's hundreds of pieces of legislation that would be changed and how it's going to affect the operations um, of of your organization is very important so following along how legislations get changed whether it's a minor tweak to a piece of legislation or whether it's 
total rewriting of the legislation is actually going to significantly, again, it's usage for proactive rewriting the legislation for your, your organization's benefit or reactive and seeing how you have to change your operational and organizational structure uh, in order to deal with uh, any legislative change. Uh, regulatory intelligence uh, certainly is something that is very big in a number of industries, uh, particularly in pharmaceuticals, also in mining, energy, and communications. Um, <clears throat> it's something that regulations change quite frequently. Uh, Craig Fleischer is one of the greats as far as uh, looking at regulatory intelligence and the importance of it. And I you know, invite you to check out, look up for anything on that Craig's written on uh, regulatory intelligence or RACI as he, as he likes to uh, use as an acronym. And regulatory affairs competitive intelligence is uh, Craig's acronym. But it, it's so important that you <clears throat> look at what regulations um, are done and made that will affect your organization's um, operations. And let's give you a great example, Airbnb. So here's the regulatory uh, intelligence help to help uh, promote your cause or uh, deal with the negative. The, you know, Airbnb in really great big cities like New York City is, uh, unregulated it's not you know it's not um, regulated and it has great impacts on the hotel industry and housing sector for affordable housing the rental markets uh, the bottom picture there um, don't motel my neighborhood is actually Las Vegas Nevada um, so you know these are these are big organizations big sorry big tourist destinations that if your company uh, needs to deal with uh, anything at the municipal level, whether it be uh, zoning like this, or whether it be um, the cab industry like Uber and all the Lyft and the ride sharing industries, it's very important to know what the current legislation regulations are and, and then help to um, propose alternative solutions. One of the things that I mentioned earlier was annual annual reports. So um, in Canada, we have CEDAR, which is actually uh, operated by the Alberta Securities Commission, oddly enough, uh, because we have provincial, we don't have a federal uh, securities regulation in Canada. But in the United States, the US Securities and Exchange Commission, through Edgar, you can actually look at uh, all of the different um, filings that corporations have put forward whether it be for mergers and acquisitions, whether it be for companies or executives selling significant shares of a, uh, their company. So all of that information is available through the various securities filings websites that you could use to see uh, where people are moving as far as um, the uh, corporate organization out there companies. And that this will help you um, to also also see um, where you your organization fits with in relation to some of the other organizations. Um, particularly in the pharmaceutical industry, and, and of course, certainly as we get into more um, advanced manufacturing and. Um, industries like that, patents and trademarks are going to be a significant, significant source of information. Um, you can actually look with, through the you know, US Patent Trademark Office or the Canadian Intellectual Property Office to look at what stages people are, what they're filing for uh, patents for, what are your competitors um, doing as, as far as um, even components of, of uh, some, some of their, uh, sorry, even components of some of their operations could be filed under a patent. So it might not be the entire piece that's that's patented, but it's one small component, which helps you, helps you look at, you know, the potential directions they're taking, whether it be sort of a re-engineering uh, operation that you're sort of 
trying to look forward as to what your organization or what the other organizations are doing. The census data, very aggregate, aggregate information, um, but it, it's very good to look at the information that the census provides with regard to demographics, um, psychographics, whether it, prov it provides you education, the education data, uh, employment data. I mean, it's a wealth of material uh, that the, the census has for you, which actually helps, particularly if you're uh, looking at expanding, uh, opening a new plant, uh, if you're looking at, it, you know, product, uh, new product launches, the census data can help you. And and, and, the, and the big data, you know, um, and it is, a, it is, this is structured, but um, this, this is, helps you to slice and dice the information, uh, to look at uh, information that uh, may help you determine where best market expansion could be. Uh, lobbying registries. Uh, I know, sorry, I, I, I'm going through this quickly and they'll have some uh, chance for questions later. But lobbyist registries are fairly important both in Canada and the United States because <clears throat> you can actually see who your competitors are lobbying and what they're lobbying um, about. So usually they'll you know, keep it um, fairly high level, but you can actually see who's been lobbying who. Again, this will help with uh, what your competitors are doing, but also looking at who the key players are within government. But if you know that someone is a, is a um, you know, they might be a small player, on, but they're on a, on a uh, uh, very important committee, or they could be, have a lot of your, uh, um, constituents within their communities. So, for example, here in Canada, uh, the dairy industry, dairy is concentrated in certain regions. So, anyone who's a member of parliament within those regions will get heavily lobbied by the dairy, uh, lo dairy lobby for their uh, supply management. Humans. So, actually, talk to a politician. Phone up your member of Congress, your member of, um, you know, the senators, and they or their staff will be willing to provide you information with what they're uh, doing, what they're thinking, um, what what directions they're taking. There, there uh, is 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 a good way to get uh, information about possible. Uh, opportunities that you might not know of, because these are the people that are the closest to government, and they also, you know, have the background information um, that you you need um, to move forward. And again, don't forget uh, public service as well. Um, the public service are the people that are working day to day, regardless of what party is in power on developing new policies and regulations, and they would have um, the, all the directions as to what, what potential outcomes could be uh, presented to uh, politicians. So, you know, they don't have the final say, but certainly in the starting uh, the path of what could possibly be um, a legislative opportunity, a regulatory change starts with the public service. Court filings, again, um, if you're looking at various court filings can help with, with um, the looking at what organizations have done in the court, whether they've taken, like, taken act, action against uh, various other companies, are they a, a litigious company, uh, have they been sued before, um, have any of their executives um, gotten into le legal trouble, certainly that's uh, helpful for, from a CI advantage. And again, do, finally, don't, don't forget state and provincial governments. Um, the states and, uh, and the provinces all have different regulations. They all have, you know, as much as we try to standardize things, the regulations um, maybe would be different in various states or provinces, which would um, either positively or negatively affect your organi organization. 
So it's important to remember to look at sort of the local level of, of our government because they as well make a significant difference um, as far as uh, legislative, legislative and regulatory change. And I know that uh, I've, I've seen this where a company may be manufacturing a product, uh, the regulation for manufacturing that product might be is different in every province of, of our country. So trying to get it standardized is certainly one of their missions to do, to, which helps them uh, to operate more efficiently. But, but it's just knowing, understanding that non-market environment um, is, is very important uh, to help them operate more efficiently. So we have about uh, 10 minutes left. Um, so I'm just going to open it up to see if there are any uh, questions out here. Sorry, I know I've covered a lot fairly quickly, um, and I'd be happy to if you want to follow up later as well. Um, if you if you're looking for any of the uh, sources of information, I'd be glad to help with that as well. Jim, this is tremendous. Um, thank you so much for the, the level of detail for what you've instructed all of us in non-market intelligence. It certainly fills in a lot of holes um, when, when you think about how to go about this. Um, I, I think we should give our attendees a couple of minutes to uh, you know, maneuver some thoughts together. Um, I've, I've checked both the, the chat box. or For those of you attending, uh, you can either place those questions if you do have them in the chat box to the right of your screen in that panel or uh, in the question box as well. We'll see them in either place. Um, Jim, let, let me kick this off a little bit with uh, a couple things that you and I were talking about earlier and, and some things that I thought of as you went ahead to present. Um, by the way, I do think my favorite part is the um, the acronym of, of, of PESL. I mean, I just think that that's quite good. And, and even uh, the one covering all the areas where we need to look at. Um, and I did turn the letters around. You do get steeple, so that's good. And now I'm working on another one. <laughs> but at any rate, um, uh, what I wanted to ask, and you and I were talking earlier, um, do you think that either the, the both financial and the competitive value of non-market intelligence um, is going to continue to have uh, a wider impact on society uh, at, at this point in time? Uh, well, I think I think to answer that question, I think it's actually um, both both um, because if you look at the the amounts of of the, the legal, fee, you know, as far as the both the Pardue Pharma example and the tobacco example, that companies, you know, government government impact on their operations is just going to going to grow, and as as people become more and more aware of what you know, is available to them as far as the legal route or um, uh, being a public interest group, uh, grassroots organization, you know, it's going to, it's going to um, just in increase, certainly social media amplifies that um, because the, um, you know, more people get involved and an issue can take off quite, quite quickly and uh, companies will have to be, you know, constantly monitoring channels like that in order to um, see what organizations or grassroots groups are doing to, uh, you know, issues that are, that are of importance to them. Um, so I think that, you know, and as the governments themselves become more and more involved in uh, regulating or just from a, a business standpoint, um, investing in, you know, various components, um, organizations will have to be much more wary of how the that government action will impact their their business. Um, so yeah, I think that there's only you know growth potential available in the sense of um, looking at um, sort of non-market intelligence. Mm. Okay. Um, uh, we have a quick question on the side. Uh, is there a professional body for CI professionals in Canada? And if there is one, um, what's the name of that organization? That would be, you know, related to the kinds of work that you're doing. Um, is there a professional? Uh, to, to quickly answer that, it, no. <laughs> um, 
Uh, and the longer answer. <laughs> so the, the longer answer, and this is um, uh, something that I've been talking to with, uh, with regard to uh, a number of people here. Certainly we have do uh, Dr. Jonathan Kaloff at the University of Ottawa, um, and also Rasta Kursky, Kursky in Saskatchewan, um, Zina Applebaum in Toronto. Like, so we have a number of people that are quite involved that are also CI fellows um, that are going to um, be, uh, you know, are interested in that, but there's no real professional organization. Certainly we have uh, SKIP and SLA in Canada. The closest that we had was uh, the Market Research and Intelligence Association, but unfortunately they folded uh, la last year. So mm. there is no real professional organization in Canada. If, if anyone was uh, part of the uh, CI Fellows webinar um, with uh, Rasta Kursky as the Canadian and, and uh, you know, looking at the difference between Canada and the United States, certainly we're not as advanced as, as the US, but uh, we're working to get it um, uh, much, much more professionalized. And if anyone wants to, uh, talk to me about that to certainly just shoot me an email. Um. Okay. Um, there's been a request. If you could please show the first slide again. Um. Okay. Let me just uh, help you go get out of this here. That one all looks like buttons. And uh, there had also been a, a related question to if you're showing the definition slide someone had asked whether or not you're going to make your deck available yeah so the deck will be available on the S sla uh, cid website Oops. okay and i think this is the slide you're talking about uh yes i believe so there wasn't a specific reference to but that that's what you opened with so uh so that's there um Okay, so so the deck will be available then. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, so the deck will be available and as well. Uh, it'll be is recorded as well. Right, and I do want to mention to those uh, still on the line with us that the links were placed in the chat box earlier from the other parts of the CI division. I I think that that is all we have at this point. Was there, um, Jim? I don't know if you wanted to amplify one of your other points. We did we did when we started the questions. You were talking about the the extended growth potential for non market intelligence, and as well as the continued financial and competitive value of this this sort of information um, but I, I think we may have uh, covered the ballpark either that or at three o'clock this afternoon you're going to get a raft of emails from from everyone who's uh, who listened today uh, um, was there anything else that you wanted to throw in or, uh, no, they were just putting my email up on the screen so you can see there we it. go so yeah. um, and no there's nothing more I think I think this is one of the things that that we're certainly uh, is is a growing, and there will be much more um, interest in this. I'm hoping, uh, you know, others we can dis discuss this, and um, you know, just as we uh, get into uh, election season, both here and in in the United States, that it will be uh, important that companies uh, pay attention to what's going on in the sort of non-market environment. Yes, I, I think that's absolutely the case. So Jim, uh, an extended thank you to you as well. And also again to our sponsors uh, for all of the SLA CID webinars this year, which is Aurora WDC. Please remember that their reconverged G2 conference is in April. And again, we are really thrilled to have their support um, for all of our webinars and to, to be able to um, coordinate with them and with all with with all of um, with themselves and with all of our professionals in the competitive intelligence community and the division at large. So again, thank you all for joining us. Um, we hope that you will take this information and uh, wave the flag as as we go forward. And again, if you watch on Connect and as well on uh, the social media pages for SLA CID division, you will see the announcements for the April webinar forthcoming 
nearly as we speak, um, but they'll they'll be well advertised, and we hope that you will join us again in the in the future. So thank you again, and good afternoon, everyone. Take good care. Thank you.